on an early Sunday morning, September 20th, 1931, three 30-something English professors at the University of Oxford went for a walk after a dinner one evening. Uh, it was C.S. Lewis, J.R.R. Tolkien, and Hugo Dyson. Dyson and Tolkien met up with their friend Lewis to discuss their faith in Jesus with him. C.S. Lewis had become increasingly hardened to the thought of a compassionate, caring God who would ever sacrifice himself for his people whom he loved so much. Lewis's heart had grown hardened to that beautiful reality ever since his mother passed away tragically from cancer when he was just nine years old. On that faithful evening, Many things stood out to him, but one particular thing really sank deep into his heart. It had to do with his love of fairy tales, actually. Lewis would write in a correspondence with one of his friends, Now what Dyson and Tolkien showed me was this, that if I met the idea of sacrifice in a pagan story, I didn't mind it at all. Actually, if I met the idea of a God sacrificing himself, I liked it very much and was mysteriously moved by it, provided I met it anywhere except in the Gospels. What they showed me was the story of Christ is simply a true myth, a myth working on us and in us in the same way as the others, but with a tremendous difference that this really happened. It was from there, that phrasing and that thought that this myth really happened started working in Lewis's heart. He then looked back on his life and rather Seeing pain and anger, he saw God's hand in the midst of it, and it led him to faith in Jesus. And I think Lewis's story is not too dissimilar to us. I think it's real easy for us in today's world to look out at all the hurt and all the brokenness and the suffering that's happening in this world. I mean, there should never be an excuse today with the internet and social media to ever go a day without weeping with those who weep. There is so much suffering out there and it's easy for us to shrink back and to have our hearts hardened out of fear and wondering, are you really in control, God? Jesus, are you really real? Or are you just a myth that I like telling myself to give myself some comfort at night? It's real easy to shrink back, but thankfully, God has given us his word and countless stories to give us courage in the days of trouble and torment by fixing our eyes on Jesus. You see, Jesus is the source of our courage whenever troubles may come. Because we see Jesus is giving us courageousness, giving us courage in three particular ways. We see that Jesus is purposeful. Jesus is prayerful, and Jesus is present with us. That is what we see in our text. We're in Mark 6. Mark 6, starting in chapters, or starting in verse 45, we get this amazing story that shows us a grander story of how we can actually take heart in the midst of our toils, our troubles, and our sufferings. Let's go to the text. So starting Mark 6, starting in verse 45, immediately he made his disciples get into the boat and go before him to the other side to Bethsaida while he dismissed the crowds. All right, so I want to stop there for a second. Mark uses the word immediately over 41 times in his gospel narrative, and he uses it in several different ways. But one of the primary ways he uses it as almost like a warning sign to the reader to pay attention. He uses it like, hey, don't miss this. You got to focus in here. And what Mark wants us to see here is that Jesus sent the disciples away on a boat by themselves. Now we can look at the very closing part of this section of this section. And we see the disciples hearts had grown hard to the feeding of the 5,000 men and the thousands of others. So this is right off the story of Jesus looking upon the crowds. They're all coming together. The disciples want to send them away, but Jesus instead feeds them and performs a, mir- performs a miracle by feeding so many people with just a handful of loaves and fish. Jesus sees their hearts are hardened. And so he sends them to go out onto the Sea of Galilee by themselves. Jesus knows they're going to encounter a storm. And this time, rather than the previous storm that the disciples have been through, 
Jesus won't be with them. He's going to be on the land by himself. You see, Jesus is being very purposeful in his actions. He's sending them out to soften their heart and experience some hardship, to experience some pain. We see Jesus is purposeful in his actions, even in the midst of difficulty. We, we know that is God's plan. At the closing of Genesis, Joseph looks out amongst his brothers and he says, as for you, you meant evil against me, but God meant it for good. You see, God the Father is purposeful in all of his ways and he will use all of our circumstances in our life to also fulfill his purposes for our lives. Psalm 138 verse 8 says, The Lord will fulfill his purpose for me. Your steadfast love, O Lord, endures forever. Do not forsake the work of your hands. God the Father will fulfill his purposes with, for our lives. And oftentimes he does this by allowing us to experience the brokenness and the destruction of this world. To allow us to experience hardship, to allow us to experience what is it like to just be tormented and beaten down. There's a purpose behind it. And now, I know that sounds difficult. I, that's difficult to say. But we've got to get our minds to that truth. Because that starts to actually give us some courage when the days of torment and trial hit us. When we start to think that this isn't suffering for just suffering's sake, but rather Jesus is actually doing something with this pain and there's a purpose behind it. Romans, Paul tells us in Romans 5.3, not only that, but we rejoice in our sufferings knowing that suffering produces endurance and endurance produces character and character produces hope. And hope does not put us to shame because God's love has been poured into our hearts through the Holy Spirit who has been given to us. God the Father is purposely allowing you and I to experience difficulty in this world to produce greater faith in him. And when we can know that truth, not feel it, at the moment, it doesn't feel that way. I'm sure the disciples, as they're out on the water, they didn't feel like Jesus was in control. But to know that truth, that my sufferings right now, that God is do, God the Father is doing something with it, and he's producing something in me, starts to give me some hope, starts to give me some courage to press in. And then I see, not only is Jesus just doing something, producing it with me, he's actually praying for me. He's aware and attuned to my pain. That's incredible, the fact that we will see Jesus, and you see it all over in Scripture. Jesus isn't just a passive bystander to our pain, but rather he is aware, he's attuned, and he's doing something about it. Let's go back to the text. Mark 6, 47. And after he had taken leave of them, he went up on the mountain to pray. And when the evening came, the boat was out on the sea, and he was alone on the land. And he saw that they were making headway painfully, for the wind was against him. So Jesus dismisses the crowd and he retreats to higher ground to spend some time in solitude and peaceful prayer with the father. He looks out and he sees his disciples. They are uh, now getting hit by a painful wind and a storm. So uh, where they're at on the Sea of Galilee, there is a violent eastward wind that can spring up called the Sharkia. Uh, and it's coming from the east. And because the Sea of Galilee is about, I think it's like 600 80 something feet below sea level. It's almost like a little basin. Sometimes this eastward wind will come through and it will be powerful and it will create a storm just like that. And all of a sudden it is peaceful and fine. Next thing you know, you're in a storm where there's uh, water surges up to 12 feet. Now they're pressing through because they're experienced fishermen. They've been on this before, but it says they're making headway painfully. And what's interesting, that word in the original language, it says they're being harassed or tormented. It's the same word Matthew uses in his narrative when Jesus looks out to his people right before he feeds them. And he says, "My peop these people, they're harassed and tormented and helpless like sheep without a shepherd. So just get that in your head for a second. Jesus is up with God the Father and he sees his people. They're harassed, 
tormented by this wind and he's praying for them. Now the text doesn't explicitly say he's praying for his disciples, but we can rightfully deduce that because God is aware of our pains. He is aware of our hurts. Psalm 46, one says, God is our refuge and strength, a very present help in trouble, a very present meaning right now, this moment, this time, God is there present with you and aware of your pain and your troubles. Jesus also prayed for his disciples. There's a story in Luke where Jesus goes up to uh, his disciple Peter and he says, Peter, Peter, Simon, Simon, uh, behold, Satan demanded to have you that he may sift you like wheat, but take heart. I've prayed for you that your faith might not fail. Jesus prayed for his disciples and not just for his disciples, guys. He prays for us. Paul says in Romans 8, 26 and 27, likewise, the spirit helps us in our weakness for we don't know how, what to pray for as we ought, but the spirit himself intercedes for us with groanings too deep for words. And he who searches hearts knows what is in the mind of the spirit because the spirit intercedes for the saints according to the will of God. The Holy Spirit prays on our behalf and the advocate sitting at the right hand of the father, Jesus is right there interceding on our behalf when we're in the middle of our pain. When we're in the middle of torment, Jesus is praying for us. Now that reality starts to give me more courage in the days of hardship. And I think we don't think about that enough because unfortunately we've been discipled in many ways by the culture to just think prayer really isn't a, a value. It's not a thing. I don't know about y'all, but I've seen a lot of people since this Hurricane Helene stuff say, keep your prayers to yourself. How about you do something? Now that's coming from a place of hurt. But I think we don't think about that prayer is powerful. And listen to me, I'm not talking about kind of just this flipping, hey, I sure, hey, I'll pray for you and never actually intend on doing it. We are supposed to be people of action when God spurs us to act but also nowhere in the Bible would God ever have us act without praying. <laughs> Prayer is powerful and it is powerful when you are in the midst of hurt, in the midst of suffering, in the midst of brokenness in your lives to know the savior of the, uver, the, savior of the universe, the creator and sustainer of all things is praying for you. He's praying for you. That builds up more courageousness in me. As I then let my mind go to, okay, God has a purpose and he's praying for me. I think we struggle sometimes going so much there because there's just a little bit of us, if we're honest with ourselves. We really think if I just do these good things, then only good things will happen to me. Like if I just go to life group and I served at serve week and I attend at least three Sundays a month, nothing, God won't let anything bad happen to me. See, the problem is God never promised us that. In fact, he promised us the exact opposite. Jesus in John 16, 33 says, I've said these things to you that in me you, have, you may have peace. In this world you will have tribulation, but take heart, I have overcome the world. See, many times we ask God to not give us problems. But in reality, God gives us something greater than that. He gives us his presence in the problems. A life of no God with no problems is a horrible life that leads to an eternal death than a life of our promised Savior present with us in the pain. That is the offering that Jesus gives us. And that's what we see later in this text. So in Mark 6, 48, and he saw that they were making headway painfully for the wind was against them. And about the fourth watch of the night, he came to them walking on the sea. So this would be about three to 6 a.m. So 
Jesus, he is in his place of perfect peace with the Father, and he sees his beloved disciples out on the waters being harassed and tormented by the brokenness of the world. And he goes to them. Don't, don't miss that. Jesus, in perfect peace with the Father, goes to them, walks out onto the deadly waters to be with his people. And then something incredible happens. The text says, he meant to pass by them, but when they saw him walking on the sea, they thought it was a ghost and cried out, for they all saw him and were terrified. This is the moment where the disciples' hard heart starts to soften up. You see, because what's happening here is a powerful moment where Jesus, for a moment, sheds his earthly form and he walks out displaying his full glory. See, this gives us insight to what, he, what Mark means by when he says he meant to pass by them. Jesus walks out on the deadly waters displaying his full glory and the disciples are terrified. Not of the storm of Jesus walking on the water. Mark is using similar language to Moses in Exodus 3 and 33 when Moses describes his encounters with God the Father. So there's a portion in Exodus 33 where Moses, he's speaking to God the Father, and he says, God, will you please show me your glory? Show me your glory. God then says to Moses, I will make all of my goodness pass before you and will proclaim before you my name, the Lord. And I will be gracious to whom I will be gracious, and I will show mercy on whom I will show mercy. But he said, you can't see my face, for a man shall not see me and live. And the Lord said, behold, there's a place by me where I shall stand you on the rock. And while my glory passes by you, I will put you in a cleft of the rock. And I will cover you with my hand until I have passed by. Then I will take away my hand and you shall see my back, but my face you shall not see. Mark is using similar language there. So Jesus, walking out onto the water, full of glory, intends to walk just like God would walk so that he doesn't kill the disciples because they see him in his full glory. The disciples look and they're terrified. And in the midst of the terror, instead of death, Jesus speaks the most famous phrase that any Jew of that day would ever know. And it's the most comforting thing they could have ever heard. And in that moment, Jesus speaks out, but immediately, there's again, there's that word immediately. There's that, hey, warning sign, don't miss this. But immediately he spoke to them and said, take heart, it is I, do not be afraid. And the, so what's happening there is the original language, Jesus walking out and instead of terror, he breaches through it and he says, take heart, I am, do not be afraid. Moses, in the exact same scenario, is looking at a burning bush that's not being consumed. And he's terrified of it. He goes, to pat, he goes to walk away. God, the Father, speaks through the burning bush. He says, Moses, take heart. Do not be afraid. I am the Lord your God. What Jesus is doing right here is he's saying to dis, the disciples, your heart has been hardened because you still think I'm this, like, cool teacher you still think that I'm this guy who's coming here to like establish a kingdom on this earth. I'm so much more than that. And in the same way, God the Father identified himself to Moses. Jesus now is identifying himself to his disciples and he's telling them, I am God. But take heart, do not be afraid. Instead of death of your hard heart, I give you mercy. And then the text says, he gets in the boat with them. He gets in the boat and the winds ceased. And I love it. The Mark says, and they were utterly astounded. Utterly astounded that the Savior, that Jesus, who there a minute ago was displaying in full glory, they thought they were about to die. They're terrified tells him, take heart, it's I. Don't be afraid. And gets in the boat with him. 
See, Jesus would later, than, would later tell them that as amazing as this encounter was, there's going to become a moment where I will display my glory in a way you can't even fathom, where I will be lifted up on high for all to see, and I will draw all men to myself because I will take on the sins of the world. I will then be buried for three days, and after the third day, I will rise again, proving that all of God's wrath has been poured out for the sins of man. And I will invite all men to come in relationship with me as they, as they seek to follow me because I am, again, not just a teacher. I'm the savior of the world. That is what Jesus is doing right here in this moment. And this is not just their story. This is our story. This is our story that God wrote us in. Romans 3, 23 and 25, for all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God and are justified by his grace as a gift through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus, whom God put forward as a propitiation by his blood to be received by faith. This was to show God's righteousness because in his divine forbearance, he had passed over former sins. You see, God the Father, instead of giving us our just death for having hardness of heart, gives us life in him through Jesus Christ, by passing over our sins through his blood. This is the gospel. This is the good news. And this is the thing that we have to preach to ourselves every day when we're in the midst of suffering and hurt. And this is the thing that we have to remind ourselves daily and remind each other daily, minute, minute by minute, hour by hour. And this is the bedrock for us to have any courage to face all the trials that are ahead of us and that want to come our way in this broken world. We anchor on the truth. This is why Paul says in 2 Corinthians 4, 16, we do not lose heart. Though our outer self is wasting away, our inner self is being renewed day by day for this light momentary affliction is preparing for us an eternal weight of glory beyond all comparison. As we look not to the things that are seen, but to the things that are unseen. For the things that are seen are transient, but the things that are unseen are eternal. Hear me. When we go through extreme difficulty, and please hear me say this, with all the empathy and compassion and sincerity that I promise you is in my heart. Paul's saying here, for us to have any shot of having any courage, don't fix your eyes on the thing that's happening. Fix your eyes on the cross. Don't look at what's surrounding you. Fix your eyes on the unseen because what God has done through Jesus Christ, he has prepared a place for you that the weight of that glory will not even compare to the sufferings that you and I experience on this earth. Don't look to the things that are seen. Look to the unseen things because it's building something and it's building hope in you. And this is how we find courage in the day of trials. This is how we find hope in the days of torment. Now, I was talking to, uh, I was talking to someone who recently lost her husband. And one of the things she said I just thought was so beautiful and powerful. She said, you know, I don't look ahead to this day where God's going to give me peace one day. I, I have a peace now. And of course it hurts. And of course it's hard. And of course, I knew God was good then, but it's like I see how good he is now so much more than I ever did. And it really is a peace that surpasses understanding. And I know you'll never fully understand it. That's why it's a peace that surpasses understanding. That's why you can't even see it. But God is not my future hope. She said, she said my, I have a real living hope now. And he's there with me every day. That is where we find ourselves when we're in the toils and we're in the trouble. Is that Jesus is our living hope now, not a future hope. You see, although I've never seen Jesus' glory manifested that way. I've never seen Jesus just shed his earthly form and see his full glory. 
I have seen it, and I've seen it in you when you've experienced trials and sufferings and you've endured and you've given praise to God's name in that. So I know I can look ahead to whatever God has for me. And if God so chooses to strike me down with an illness, I know he will meet me and sustain me because I've seen him meet my friend who at 35 years old, one of the healthiest, most fit men I've ever been around, gets struck down with ALS. To get ALS at that age is like a 0.001% chance. He has no family background in history of it. But I have watched God meet him And I've watched him speak over and over about God's peace in his life. And and he shared with me, he said, you know, I am praying for a miracle. But if God so chooses to not give me that, God wins and I win. I know God will meet me there. If God so chooses that God so chooses to take one of my children much sooner than I'd ever would want. I know, I know he will meet me and he will sustain me because I've watched two people sitting right there, two parents lose a toddler, lift their hands at their son's celebration of life service and sing, oh, happy day, oh, happy day, you washed my sins away. And I've watched God sustain them and carry them as they pour into others going through the exact same horrific grief. So I know that if God so decides to allow me to experience that, he will meet me. And I know that if somehow God decides to take my wife Ashley earlier than I planned, that God will be with me and he'll be present with me and he will sustain me because I've watched a woman who was on a glo- one of our global trips serving the Lord halfway across the world. Her husband dies out of nowhere. I was at the hospital and I watched her after traveling for almost two days, walk into the hospital. And guys, it was as if she was glowing with the glory of God as if God was carrying her herself. And then she prayed the single most powerful prayer I've ever heard in my life. And she said, I know, Lord, my husband knows you and is with you. And you will be with me and you'll be with our family. That is utterly astounding. And so while while I've never seen Jesus face to face, I have seen his glory in that moment. And that is why I know no matter what may come, I will not give up. I refuse to believe that Jesus is just some myth because this really happened and he's really meeting people and their deepest of darkest or hurts. The scriptures speak to we overcome the enemy by the blood of the lamb and the word of our testimony. And it is your testimony and it is God's testimony that speaks to me no matter what may come, I can endure all things through Christ who strengthens me. And so I refuse to give up because God continues to show me how big and strong and powerful and glorious he is. So I can take heart and not be afraid. C.S. Lewis would go on and he'd become one of the most prolific and profound uh, theologians ever. Um, And his love of fairy tales actually increased. And then he would write different fairy tales, but he wrote them from the perspective of trying to write Jesus into into the greater narrative. And one of my favorite works of his is the Chronicles of Narnia. Uh, Chronicles of Narnia, it's it's a series that mostly follows... Uh, four siblings, Peter, Susan, Edmund, and Lucy, in their discovery of the world of Narnia. And in Narnia, they meet the great King Aslan, who is a mighty lion. He is uh, the creator of Narnia. He's the protector of Narnia. Uh, He is the Jesus figure in Narnia. And my favorite relationship of all the siblings with Aslan is the youngest, Lucy. Lucy in Prince Caspian hasn't seen Aslan in a little bit, 
and she sees Aslan, and she goes, oh, Aslan, you're bigger. And he says, no, I'm not. You're just older. She says, you're, wait, you're not bigger? He says, no, I'm not. But every year you grow, you'll find me bigger. And I don't know about y'all. I thought as I got older, I would become less afraid. And I'm finding out I got like new things to worry and be afraid of every day. There are just new things popping up on my radar. I'm like, I didn't even know that was in there. But what dwarfs that is I see God get bigger and bigger and bigger. And not because he's getting bigger, but simply because he's growing my faith. And the more I press into him, no matter what, may, no matter what fears may come, I know that my God is big enough to dwarf those fears. And I can take heart no matter what may come. Because Jesus has a purpose for everything he's doing in my life. And he's praying for me. And he's present with me in the pain. And so hear me. Take heart. Do not be afraid. Jesus has overcome. Let me pray for us. God, thank you for today. I thank you for your grace on our lives. God, I thank you for your presence. I thank you that you did choose to leave your place of perfect peace and to experience the brokenness of this world, to experience the hurt, to experience what it's like to be us. And then you willingly gave your life up on a cross so that we can have relationship with you. And so I thank you for that. God, remind us of your goodness every day. Help us powerfully see that you are in control and you are working even though we can't feel it or see it, but we can know that you are for us, not against us. So Father, I thank you for your word and for your truth. Seal it on our hearts. So now let's take a few minutes and let's spend it with the Lord and just ask him to settle anything on our hearts right now in this moment and then I'll close this.